Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for the webinar today and hopefully you've been on some of the others for the series and hopefully we'll be on some more today. We're going to wait about two minutes while we wait for some latecomers to join and we will talk to you very soon. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, hopefully, like I said earlier, if you were on, that you've been on a few of these other webinars this week for our series, and hopefully we'll see you on the others today. I uh, just want to say a few things up top. I'd like to make sure everyone can hear me okay, so if you could just post where you're watching from and your name, that'd be really great to see who we have with us. And then in the chat window, I'm just about to put, and I'm going to give it a second for everyone to get Twitter up, I'm just about to put uh, some text you can put in for a tweet. And if you tweet it out with a hashtag intact, the first five people are going to win a t-shirt. So I'm going to post that, give everyone a chance to open it up, and there it is. So just to let everyone know a few things at the start, we are recording this. We'll be releasing the video after, so if anyone that you know of who wants to watch it but is unavailable, they will be able to see it after the fact. Uh, you can ask questions. We're going to have time at the end for questions. So. Please, as soon as you think of one, send it over. Don't feel like you have to wait, and don't feel like we may not get to it, so you shouldn't ask. By all means, ask away. Even if we end up not being able to get to it, we can take it offline after, so that's not a problem. We do have a lot to go over today, so I'd like to get us started right off, and I'd like to pass over to our presenter, uh, Technical Director at Electronic Arts, Josh Nixdorf. All right, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, it's actually late evening for me. I uh, am in Stockholm at the moment. Um, <clears throat> let's go slide back. Okay, so uh, this is going to be a uh, there and back again. Yes, I stole that name from the Hobbit. I thought it was a little appropriate for this. Um, effectively, um, I'm the product owner and technical director for the development and release engineering team at Electronic Arts, uh, which is a fancy name for the team that does the builds, the CI, CD, this kind of stuff. Uh, we don't do it for all the titles, but we do do for the vast majority of them. Um, and I've been in this team for about 11 years. I'm going to talk more about how it's changed over the 11 years. But basically, this team started off as a, a ragtag collection of developers skimmed off the game teams uh, and went through a lot of ups and downs, hurdles to become uh, the DevOps team that we are today. And so this presentation is ultimately a chance to um, uh, talk about how we went through that journey, uh, how we came to understand our, sort of our role in the world, how we got the company doing the CI, CD stuff, uh, and how sort of DevOps is really, and, and that DevOps mindset has really helped us do some things that would have been completely impossible otherwise. All right, so uh, I'm completely aware that a ton of what you're going to hear over the next little bit is going to sound completely insane. Um, and so I wanted to put together just some basic, uh, basic idea of some of the scale things we're working at. Um, good or bad, these things work for us uh, and, and are related very much to our problem. So 
like I said, this is mostly just a preview so that if anything I say sounds completely nuts, you can go back after and be like, oh yeah, that's right, they're talking 30 minute clean build times. That would be a problem if I build times for that long. Um, we'll get into the really important ones of these later, but the highlights are there's a lot of people contributing to a particular code base, could be a thousand. Uh, most projects are smaller than that, but the big ones absolutely are there. Um, branches are generally quite low. Um, for the most part, most of the titles are working with two. One for the developers and one for the people that work on content levels, these types of things. Uh, this is generally because integrations are incredibly painful at the scale we work at. Uh, and so it's just easier to basically front load all that burden. Um, executable size is noted on here so that it goes back to the build times are absolutely huge on this stuff. Linking takes a while. Um, our artifacts are huge. The games are Blu-ray discs, right? So, you know, if anything sounds like, geez, how come we're not using this tool? This would be great. You know, Artifactory isn't necessarily the best at 50 gig artifacts. So at least we have been able to make it work properly with that. And so there's just small concessions like that that makes it all barrel the rest of this. So, I mean, if you're going to be doing this DevOps stuff properly, measurement is a really big um, impact, of, uh, a big way to identify some of your success right today. And so, very early on, uh, when they first created this sort of central team to do the builds, um, it was a contentious idea. Some teams really liked the idea, um, but for the most part, central teams aren't game teams, and so it's hard for them to, to really find a place. And, and so we had to quickly come down to a way of really being able to demonstrate our value. And so this is where we kind of take inspiration for something like McDonald's. If anybody remembers those really old signs that were used to actually increment up how many hamburgers they serve, um, you know, that, that really resonates. And so there's a chance to go, well, what we're really doing is saving millions and millions of hours. And I'll show you some um, details on that later, but, but I really mean that. Um, centralizing builds is an opportunity to, going back to those build times, to really save developers. They can do some minimal set of things, and the CI CD will take care of a lot of that other stuff and enable them to go and do other things. And this is really important for our business. QA for an average title for electronic arts can put in upwards of 2 million hours worth of testing in a single year cycle. Something like the, the big games like um, FIFA or Madden easily see something like this. That's a tremendous amount of testing when you think about it. And the problem fundamentally for us is the first 48 hours of gameplay, users are going to log 10 to 100 million um, hours of gameplay. Something like FIFA, Madden, Star Wars launch, those things can have 10 million players in that first weekend. If all of those people put in just a couple of hours, it's huge. And going back to the two million hours of QA is a lot, but 48 hours uh, into the game, it's been way surpassed. And so we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can during, or everything, yeah, everything we can during the development period um, to save that time, save QA time, to make sure they're not doing two million hours of testing the same stuff over and over. How do they get you know breadth out of that time? How do the developers add you know? features, add tests to be able to ensure that overall this thing is, is of quality. And so we're able to step back and go, we might just be doing the builds for people, but fundamentally what we're able to do is make sure that the quality is there to have more time for future development, basically assist with the whole rest of the process. Why we DevOps? I and mean, that's a bit of a, a funny way to even put that, but, but I really want to put this scale uh, up here. So the green bars are basically, and we'll get into the definitions of 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 .0 later, um, but basically we're in, the, we're in the transition right now um, to sort of what you, I expect most in the community to recognize as modern DevOps. The other ones are my attempt to sort of retcon what we were doing at the time within sort of the, the DevOps mindset. But important to hear is back in say 2006 when I started on this team, um, the build team was a handful of people. At this point, it's nearly 100 people. It's tremendous growth. When you look at the rest of these metrics, you start seeing these kind of logarithmic scalings of, of some of the things that Electronic Arts is doing. So specifically, daily commits goes from something that might be 20 to 100 on a project. Um, the titles that our team is supporting goes from a handful of titles to you know, 30 titles. Most importantly, the title team sizes. 10 years ago, a big team was 100 people. Now a big team is 1,000 people. Um, the thousand people isn't crammed into one location. It might be over um, three, four, five, you know, depending on how you want to count them, even more. Um, but that's something that the company needed to do in order to be able to build the games the way they wanted to build them. 
And if we hadn't learned the, the, you know, the, the lessons of DevOps, made some of the changes that we've been making early on, I don't know that we'd have been able to have effectively scaled with that. Um, and you see that with the rest of these numbers. You know, the, the artifact size is substantially increased. And, and fundamentally, getting back to what I was talking about with the savings, that's the big thing. That the first sort of generation of our existence, you know, maybe we're able to save, you know, 20 man years worth of effort. That sounds maybe really impressive, but if you've got 10 people on your team, yeah, okay, you know, they've all saved, you know, one and a bit of people, but that's, that's actually not that great. You know, it would value, but, but if a, a producer comes and says, hey, well, if we took those 10 people and put them on a game team, how, much, you know, how many dollars would we make? We're probably losing compared to that. Uh, and so we need to get a lot more efficient and be able to provide more value to the company. And, and we have, and at this point, you know, that, that last number, of, um, if I were to calculate based on, say, last year, we're looking at the point where each year those 100 people are able to save, say, a thousand hours worth of um, testing. Now, hopefully someone's thinking really critically about this and goes, that sounds really, you know, dubious. And, and it is. I mean, the way that I'm coming up with those numbers is largely taking, you know, the amount of projects that we would build, the time that we're saving a developer, you know, per commit that they can make to make, and going, well, that's value add that we made since they didn't have to do that now. And the problem with that argument is quite frequently that developer wouldn't have done that. If there's three platforms and four configurations, that's 12 things they need to build, you know, for each five minutes, that's an hour. The developers aren't going to spend an hour validating everything before they, you know, commit. It's, it's, well, and that's just on the build side. Testing would say double that, maybe longer. They weren't going to do that. And, and so, you know, we might have saved, we might have put, you know, 1,200 uh, man into automation, um, but the actual savings, the, the people savings might be less. But it goes back to that quality trade off. Those people didn't have to cut those corners, and so quality was able to be maintained. So, still valuable. All right, so we go back to the very beginning on this. This is, like I said, what I retconned to DevOps uh, 1.0. Um, this like, it basically started in 2006. Um, we didn't do DevOps or, or even operations mindfully. Now, we couldn't have known that we were doing DevOps. I don't think the name got you know, coined until 2010. But fundamentally, as I was talking about before, this really started off as a dev team. Where this team really came from was you know, a number of the, the game development teams were in the terrible pattern of hiring a junior engineer, generally right out of school, putting them on their team, having them do the, the build stuff, uh, which usually meant build system, not so much CI, CD. Um, that person would be the first person in every morning, the last person to go home every night, and then when it would come time to fix bugs, that person would get pulled onto the team to fix bugs, at which point they would have a much better time uh, than they had had the previous year, and they would earn some credit doing something new, and they would immediately be promoted into front end or AI or gameplay or some other team, at which point the team would have to start the whole new cycle of well, we need another build engineer. And so in 2006, they, they basically started to recognize the damage that was being done from that. And so they took the various build engineers, put them a little bit further away, basically just past arm's reach, so they couldn't pull them onto their projects uh, and, and sort of repeat that cycle. And, and it was really important. It took a big cultural change in order to be able to start really iterating on things like automation. So the, the big themes of, um, of sort of DevOps 1.0 for us were a transition to meaningful CI CD, we'll get into what that means, but fundamentally uh, we had to root out the concept that it works on my machine. And honestly I can say that like, that's not a phrase I've heard anyone say in a really long time. Um, if, I mean, maybe someone who just joins the company will say it, at which point their peers would be like, yeah, that's not acceptable, go figure this out. Um, we had our first attempt at automation as code. Uh, and we attempted to write our own CI engine, which is exactly as crazy as it probably sounds. So let's get into those. So, I mean, I'm assuming all of you guys are big on, you know, uh, continuous integration, continuous <laughs> delivery. So I, I don't need to uh, sell the upsides on this. So I'll give you the horror story. I mean, when I started the company, we didn't have this. There was a server that ran automated builds, but they weren't trustworthy. They weren't reliable. Nobody used them for anything. Thing. Um, and they didn't even deliver artifacts to QA downstream. That was still all handled manually. Um, and so, as I said, that build engineer job was really first person in the morning to make sure the QA had something, last person out at night to ensure that the build was being created so that QA would have something in the morning and you don't have you know, 200 testers sitting there with nothing to do, burning hours. Um, so, in, like I said, obvious trade-offs, but we just we hadn't had the discipline to get there. Um, oh, sorry, obviously, obviously benefits. Uh, now, the problems that we encountered, um, 
some of the things that we hadn't thought about when we started doing this was we kind of created a safety net for people. Once CI was part of the culture, um, we started seeing behavior where maybe they were doing a little less testing on their side, a little less building than they could do, and just letting the CI take care of that for them. In fact, you know, many years ago, one of the senior engineers at the company uh, was departing for a new job, and so the parting words to me were, I'm not sure that CI or you know this automation stuff that we focused on was was a good call. It was fundamentally, it, he felt that it would have been a mistake. And that wasn't to say that he thought CI in principle was a bad idea, but that the way that we had implemented it ultimately set everybody up to be lower quality engineers in his opinion. Now I've seen lots of people argue the um, the other way on that, but it's something to really make us step back and think, you know, what are the consequences of this? Um, and I think you know this plays into a bit of the we'll get to it later, but the modern DevOps mentality of for us, it wasn't that CI was bad. It's that we had taken CI and we'd really said, okay, you guys will handle that, so we're going to go do this other thing. And that, I think, is fundamentally anti DevOps, but we didn't know that at the time we weren't thinking about it. We were trying to change culture, and so this was a necessary step. In the same vein, we kind of disempowered people in this way. Um, people who might have been interested in, in being a bigger part of that culture, people who were interested in, in being part of that automation, well, you're not on this team, we do that, so you, you do your thing, we'll do our thing. Um, and, and so that really, we had created an environment where the people who didn't want to participate didn't have to participate. We'd also created an environment where the people who wanted to were further away from being able to. And so, I mean, overall, you, I mean, as the scale shows, this is still a resoundingly good move, um, but it wasn't the way we implemented it wasn't fundamentally um, perfect. And you're going to see the impact of these things throughout some of the rest of these slides. And it's something that we're, we're really still working on today. Automation is code. It says V1 because it was our first attempt at it. This is going to be a bit of a theme for this conversation and this presentation as well. Um, and a lot of the, anyone who's thought of it, and I guess when I say automation is code, my, my definition of this is I don't want someone to log into the GUI for Build for Durant Hill or you know Jenkins and go. Oh, let me just write all these things in. There. Um, it's not really scalable, uh, and you end up with all sorts of customization. Like, you guys know the problems with these things, and so I mean, the benefits of this obviously um, reduced effort. Right? You're going you're gonna to start having much more things in common. For us, a really interesting side benefit of this was we actually had greater portability of the developers between our teams. I don't know how many people this will resonate with. But e even though all our games are games, and you would think they're quite in common, uh, the technology stacks might differ tremendously between games, how AI is written, the front ends, these things are, are sort of, they're, they're incredibly creative. Uh, and so you often find that the, the code is substantially divergent between titles. Um, and so it was actually quite difficult, especially back then, for developers to move from one title to another. They kind of had to relearn everything. And so CI was a really interesting, it was the first time that we'd ever kind of divorced engineering from the particular game products. And so now even though you were going to move to a new team and what you were working on would be fundamentally different, your, your engineering experience had a lot more in common than you would ever have before. The CI jobs that you ran over there are still the same ones here. So you, you, know, you might not know how to make your change, but once you've committed, everything that happens after that is something that you're familiar with. It helped a lot of people. Uh, and another really big one is you get this really better experience with the trailing edge. Um, and what I mean by that is sort of the titles that are least able to invest in CI and CD are now kind of pulled up by everybody else. Uh, and so that was great. We have some very large games at the company uh, that make a lot, a lot of money. And as a result, they're able to invest more heavily in the processes. If you have a game that kind of trips and falls and maybe last year's release didn't make a ton of money, um, it's a business. And so that team, you know, they want to fund them, they want to support them. But do you want to spend your money on a builder engineer? Do you want to spend your money on the guy who's going to help with some back-of-the-box feature? Now, that's short-sighted thinking sometimes, but it's, it's not unreasonable. Uh, and so one of the major benefits of this was really being able to help those teams out for the cheaper. But fundamentally, where we went wrong with this on the first time, and you can tell from the scale that we tipped over to the bad side on this one, it's too complex for our teams and too complex for our users. We wrote this thing. At this time, we're actually using BuildForge. And then it had a reasonably robust um, uh, API. And so we had written some insane stuff to dynamically load in all our jobs at one time. And um, I was one of the people who wrote it, so it made perfectly reasonable sense to me. But uh, my team at the time didn't feel that was the case. 
and, and and ultimately what I've done is sort of you know kick them out of something they were familiar with. And, and, and the, you know, I, I made the note a moment ago about you know, not wanting to go into the GUI to be able to type all these things. That's high maintenance. What I didn't appreciate at the time was that's also the way that people who ramp on to the team learn the patterns. If they're not familiar with CI or CD, which wasn't uncommon in our new grads a decade ago, um, you know, what, what Jenkins would allow them to do, help them understand what Jenkins should be. Once you embed them in some type of code that they're our configuration file, um, it's a lot more abstract. So we found it was a lot harder to learn. Um, and this was the same problem with our customers. So this, they didn't necessarily like to be in the GUI, but now we've made it even harder for them to do that. Another fundamental problem that we encountered was that we hadn't expected, because we were quite immature, uh, drag on change. You know, now that we have all these people using these same files, this is great. It's, it's cheaper for us. It's better for them. But I want to change something. Well, they don't want to change that. They're having a milestone right now. And so suddenly it became this huge impediments to be able to actually make um, new things on this stuff. And we, we really weren't prepared to deal with that. Um, and as part of that, it ends up being a worse experience for the leading edge. It, you know, the team that's at the very front of this is dragging everybody else along with them. Um, and there are benefits to that. And, and some of the teams that are at that leading edge are happy with that. But some of those teams need to make big transitions themselves. Uh, and that's not where they want their time being spent, is in helping other clients. And so ultimately, uh, much as I was invested in this, it was something that needed to be killed. We, we made a mistake. Uh, and so our original attempt at automation as code needed to die. Another mistake we made, as you can tell again by the scale, was we thought we were brilliant. And so after we wrote that first one, of course the reason automation as code failed wasn't our fault, it was BuildForge's fault. It, it didn't do all these things for us. And so we, we were smarter than that. We were going to write our own system, uh, and it would be better. And so then one of the benefits was we did have a chance to really invest more in this automation as code idea. Because now we got to define the configuration and the interfaces, and we had to think more about what the patterns were. And one of the major benefits of this was it was the very first time, and because this team was doing the CI, we were doing operations without realizing we were doing operations, but now we were really developing something. We weren't just writing you know, Perl scripts here and there, or you know, Perl. Um, we were actually writing, you know, C sharp code to try and build out this service to do this thing, and so it was the very beginning of something that was you know, really, really great. Um, but the obvious problems ensue as well, which is if you build a custom tool, you can't hire people that know your custom tool. Maybe the small pool of people who've left your team, but like the public is not a great place to go for this. And um, the other problem is, as I mentioned, we were effectively an operations team, and so. We assumed that we were all wonderful developers and there wouldn't be any support for our tools because we were right to write the first time. And hopefully you're all shaking your head at me because you should be. We were fundamentally wrong. And so we woefully underestimated the amount of, of burden that support for that thing would be. Um, but the big mistake with this, the thing that should have stopped us from doing it and the thing that our, our leadership should have prevented us from doing this in the first place was that building this thing really wasn't ever going to give us any type of competitive advantage. We're an entertainment company. We're going to talk like a software company, act like a software company, but fundamentally what we do is write games. Now, if we had open sourced what we were doing or we had spun off the company and sold it, maybe you could come up with a business reason, but, but writing a proprietary CI system uh, and keeping it all to yourselves, maybe there's a reason for it. If it gives you a competitive advantage, you should totally do it, but, but it didn't. And so we just ended up with a bunch of tech. And so in our DevOps one, sort of we successfully managed to get CI CD into the company, but we made a bunch of mistakes. So by then we had matured a little bit. It's uh, 2010 now. And so we're getting into DevOps 2.0. Now, we're not aware that it's DevOps, even though DevOps is a recognized thing. Um, but at least we've smartened up a little bit. And now we're not really doing dev anymore. Now we still write uh, all sorts of code, but we're not aspiring to go build systems anymore. We've, we've learned our lesson. Um, as well, because we're starting to look for more standard tools, we're finally able to start recruiting non-game engineers. And this goes back to that culture a little bit. Um, because the team came from game engineers, and it is a company of, of game developers, they are a logical group of people to hire. And admittedly, if I do a posting, most of the people who are going to apply to that posting, especially in 2010, are people who, whether they'll admit it to me in the interview process or not, want to be game engineers. And so this is about the time where we have enough of an understanding of what we do that we can really, we know what we're looking for now. We know how to write a, a, 
a job posting, and we can kind of start finding people that have done this type of job from but outside of our industry. This is all the point where also the point where the real um, DevOps uh, mentality starts to kick in. Um, we're starting to recognize that Dev has no idea what IT does, and IT has no idea what Dev does, and that's kind of the way they want it to be. The developers want to be focusing on writing obscure, deep-level C++ code, and IT wants to run as a classic IT shop with any at any particular company. Um, and you know, we're kind of looking at both parties going, but you guys aren't that confusing, but the relationship just never seemed to be there. And so it was a perfect spot for us to be able to step in and bridge that gap. The QA ended up being in exactly the same boat, uh, and, and quality engineering is part of that. So, you know, they'd be attached to the dev work, but you know, they have some other other requirements and they're not quite able to understand. So, so we find our place as a, a really a bridge for all these organizations. It's just really great for us. Uh, some of the challenges that we encounter at this point, up until this point, all that CI CD is running on physical blades in the, the various data centers. There's a chance for us to virtualize. Um, culturally, we start thinking a lot more about sharing. And so not necessarily us sharing back out. We're not ready for that, but we're looking at, geez, we've got to stop building these things Surely this problem exists in some other industry. What's the world doing for these things? And we have to make another attempt at automation as code because we didn't learn our lesson the first time. So you know, PWE um, infrastructure as a service, I mean this, again, you guys are probably <laughs> very familiar with all the benefits of this. And I bring it up because the fun sort of anecdote for us was this wasn't something that we thought about and said, hmm, maybe we should do this. This was a, the data centers are out of space. There is no way for you to do any more builds. You're going to have and so, uh, you know, the, but we really gained a bunch of um, benefits for the automation that we hadn't necessarily predicted. Um, or rather, once we knew more about it, it became more apparent. Reliability skyrockets. Because you don't have all these oddly configured um, machines lying around, you're able to you know, consistently deploy an image. It's fantastic. Um, overall developer experience improves substantially as a result of that. Plus, you know, because you're eliminating the lead time, bringing in hardware, somebody asks for something, if you've planned it appropriately, you can spin it up much faster than actually procuring new hardware. And then, as I mentioned, solves the space constraint. Um, but going back to the culture, this was a really interesting one for us. IT, at that time, were not experts at virtualization. And so it was their domain, but they weren't really leading us. They didn't understand how to use this type of thing to help lead the game teams. And so we had to expand into their domain and become the subject matter experts on these um, and, and really drive that change. Now, I have it listed as, as bad at the time, um, but again, that was because we didn't realize that DevOps was a really good way of thinking about the world. So we were sort of grumbling why we were having to do someone else's job, um, but still overall a massive, um, uh, a massive benefit for the company. I mean, just on the reliability, using physical machines, we were never really able to break sort of nine times out of ten we could deliver a, a useful result. Whether it's a pass or a failure, something that wasn't the false positive. You know, once we virtualized, we basically saw those numbers skyrocket to 95 plus percent. Because you, like I said, you dealt with environment inconsistencies. Looking to the industry was a really interesting one for us. I've got this one as a balance. Obviously, this is a good thing. Uh, but there were some implications that, that we haven't yet dealt with. Um, and so as we stopped sort of writing our own custom solutions for everything, we obviously have fewer custom problems. Um, one of the big things that wasn't a problem in 2006, but was in 2010, the games industry in 2006 was incredibly insular and not easy to get into. Basically, everybody's website said, don't bother applying if you don't have experience. I remember when I was leaving school, someone's website said, don't even apply if you don't have a master's degree. And so the bar was quite low. Well, by you know, 2010, at least that generation, Apple had released the iPhone. And now if you wanted to make games, you just had to have an iPhone, which lots of people had, and pay Apple the $100 for the developer kit. That was a huge change from the tens of thousands of dollars you might have been paying for a console development kit. And so the, the, the industry had suddenly exploded, and so there's lots of people who have experience um, building games that sound just like the games that we do, but they're using modern frameworks, modern languages, modern tools, and we're suddenly feeling really outdated. Um, so this was a good thing. Being able to see what those guys are doing really inspired us to push harder. Um, hiring gets even easier. Like I said, there's, once we're able to start relating back to what we're doing to the rest of the industry, um, we, we learn what the right words to use. 
we learn, oh, hey, you know, using these custom tools are really causing us some problems. Um, and a big piece of this is Jenkins. You know, every time we were using our own system or some obscure, a very expensive product, it's just making it harder to be able to employ people. Once you're using something like Jenkins, man, the kids coming out of school these days have even used this kind of stuff. Everybody has experience with it. And not just for hiring, but like our users have it. Everyone who's joining the company loves that stuff. Right now, I will tell you, I was in a meeting earlier today where someone was complaining about um, Jenkins, talking about how much they love the old things. The only people who ever who have anything negative to say about it are people who grew up on something else. We have tons and tons of people who love the way that it works, um, and those are the people who grew up on it, right? They're, they're the most familiar with it. The impediments we haven't thought of, though, we have a lot less in common with the development teams now. A lot less. We, we came from them, we used to live in their world, we we're mostly aspiring wannabe developers, but now we don't look like them, we don't talk like them, we care about other things. They want to talk about frame rates and we want to talk about, you know, the VM performance or, you know, some other metric that just is completely foreign to them. Um, and it's not that they can't understand it, but, you know, it's like, we used to be friends, what happened to you guys? Um, and that's a bit of a rough thing to go through. You're, you're leading a culture change in the company. Um, part of that is a new career path. We're starting to think more about what these operations things need to be. Now, this has been happening in other parts of the company at the same time. This is about the time the games started being substantially more online. That's even the development teams are needing to have operations roles. And those people are going to the same thing, that you know, they have to know what you know to be able to do their job. But they seem to care about other things. And they keep getting hired to other companies. You know, what's, what's going on here? Other non-game companies. And so it's, it's weird. Culture is changing. Part of this, as I said before, when the team was built, it was built out of people who almost assuredly wanted to be developers on game development teams. And so we keep saying, no, no, we're going to be more operations. We're going to be less dev. We don't really have a plan for the people who don't want to do that. Um, and then fundamentally, it goes back to, I mean, not to put us into existential crisis, but it goes back to that very first um, point about why are we doing this? Why do we have this central team that's doing this? And so it's really making us go, you know, I keep asking around, but I don't find a whole lot of other central build engineering teams. You know, why, why is it that we do this? Where are we going? What's, what's our end game here? Do we want to be doing this for forever? And as we get to the future, we'll have more insight into what we find out, what we've decided on this. All right, automation is code 2.0. I mentioned that we tried this again. These are going to be exactly the same uh, equation as you saw last time. Except for this time, we've done it a little bit better. We've managed to solve the two complex for teams and users. Um, but what we completely missed was sharing isn't free. Once we have reduced that complexity, everybody will obviously just use this. They'll all greatly benefit. This is going to be a cakewalk. Sharing isn't free. Seems kind of obvious, but we miss it. And we keep missing it. Every time someone comes, whenever we look at doing this automation as code, it's almost always selfishly to save our time, to build the central, you know, build CI engineering team's time. We want things to be in common so that if somebody fixes something, we get that. I mean, it has downstream benefits to those end users, but fundamentally, we're trying to make our lives easier. I have that team of 100, and if I had more of this, maybe we'd need 10 to be able to do that. The problem is, teams don't always want this. They want something that's custom. And, and fundamentally, what they really want is everybody to share, everybody to use their things. They want to share out. They don't necessarily want to take your stuff. They've assumed that they've done it right. Um, or even just integrating your changes, I have to validate that. It turns out it creates more work in some ways. It still has all the benefits that you'd imagine, but for whatever reasons, we always just assumed this would be next to free, and it wasn't. So we are still using this, but fundamentally it's failed on us again. The other problem, for us, was that we built this before um, pipelines was available in Jenkins. And so we built our own automation as code system, which now makes us horribly deviated from sort of modern Jenkins. And, and now we have to go through the process of tearing that out by the roots and doing this again on pipelines. But at least the benefit is we keep making this mistake, we keep reinforcing those lessons, and hopefully when we do this, this next time, we're coming at it with much more reasonable expectations. Did I mention writing our own CI engine again? No, actually, that's just a joke. Um, we were wise enough not to do that, though we have now inherited several, because uh, our team has grown, and we've taken on lots of the other teams in the company, 
who had also done the same thing, that they had been their CI engine. So a good chunk of this period of our life is spent um, removing, uh, or, or basically eliminating that debt. But the interesting note here is, given the right scenario, we would actually write our own CI engine again. Um, now, it's not that we don't have any, uh, uh, it, it, you know, we love Jenkins, um, but it's one of those, you know, how far can it take us? If we had, if we had perfectly stable workflows, is it going to deliver the best possible solution? If you had something completely bespoke that enabled all sorts of crazy custom electronic arts behavior, we could probably get a better overall performance. And so but there's an important note there. Well, I might open the door to, we would make this mistake again. Um, it would only be under the assumption that our workflows were so mature they had stopped changing and suddenly doing custom things was able to, to get us further. Um, and I'm not convinced that world is ever going to happen. So. I think we'll be with the bottle for a very, very long time. All right, so the next period of our DevOps, this DevOps 3.0. Now is when we finally start being aware of DevOps. Let there be light. We know what to talk to people about. We're, fine, we're able to go to conferences where we're understanding these things. It's fantastic. And the first thing that hits up is, my God, people have been doing this for a really long time. What the heck is wrong with us? And so we need to play this catch up. How do we start participating in the community? And so a bunch of good questions come from this. A bunch of our, our strategy starts being about things like open source. Um, strategy is always about cloud. We'll talk about that. But you know, it really helps us think about where it is that we need to go next. And so we can start with open source, because this is the one that we've actually been making progress on in the last little bit. Um, benefits are there. I don't have to sell anybody on open source. Uh, whether you're pro or con, I mean, you, you know why people would do it. Um, the big reasons we hadn't already done it were the legal purpose. Um, our company is tremendously risk averse. Um, the games don't really have much opportunity to use open source stuff, and it's a terrifying thought to the lawyers when they would do something like that. So in general, the guidance has been to stay away from this. Um, as a central team, it really didn't make any sense to us. But no one had ever had the conversation, and it didn't make sense to have it on our behalf. So when we engaged finally to start this, you know, you make the business case for, well, you know, we're going to get higher quality output, we're going to be able to reduce our technical debt, which fundamentally reduces our costs, you know, and it kind of helps, <laughs> well, this stops dev for the sake of debt. This is the concept where, like, if you have a developer and he doesn't have something to do, he'll probably develop something for you. Um, open source was a way, well, we'll get back to how we use that strategy, but um, the important part was um, the lawyers were, uh, lawyers, leadership, everybody was like, well, of course you guys should be using this. Um, but so fantastic, we're able to take that hurdle down. Now this idea of extra effort comes back to this um, stop dev for the sake of dev. This isn't something that's a fundamental truth of open source, it was a way that we applied our policy. The guidance that my team has is, is basically, if you write anything, well before you write anything, you should be checking to see if someone has already solved this problem. Whether it's open source or off the shelf, it doesn't matter. But we shouldn't be solving problems that are already solved. If you insist that this is not a solved problem, then I require that they're going to have to push these things back to the community. They're going to have to go through the hassle of open source on this thing. And I don't say hassle because I think that it is a hassle. What I mean is it's that little bit extra effort. Um, and so now if I have an engineer who maybe, well, this thing was pretty close, but really I just want to write my own thing, he's not going to do that. Anymore. Now that he knows he has a little bit extra that he's going to have to do to be able to open source this, and that he's going to have to show off this code publicly and all these other things that come to that you know what, maybe I'll just use that thing that solves most of my problems. And so we get better engineering maturity out of this. <clears throat> Additionally, and this, this is an opportunity to talk about the benefit that we really get from cloud leaks on this stuff. Um, you know, the enterprise plugins for Jenkins, or rather the open source plugins for, for Jenkins are, are really the way that we're able to communicate, uh, contribute back to the community right now. We don't have a habit of uh, of returning things that we've built outside of Jenkins yet. But right now, as we make bug fixes, I mean, when we started on Jenkins, we absolutely forked our code internally, made the fixes, and had no intention of contributing that stuff back. After about a year of doing that, it was obvious the problems this was going to have. Um, but, you know, CloudBees was a, an interesting opportunity to engage and get a bunch of extra benefits. Things like enterprise support, um, be able to help with some of that uh, developer burden we're talking about of the testing stuff that they do, get some extra scalability and stability. And this was a way, rather than have to do it ourselves or wait for the open source community to do it, we we'll to hop on board and um, uh, get some extra benefits for uh, uh, without us having to do it. So, a shout out to those guys. 
All right, so the future. The reason I've got Thor on this slide, so this is, this is where we're going. This is part of this DevOps 3.0. What else are we doing as part of that? So Thor is the name of, uh, we really love our narratives. Um, and I don't, I don't even know who came up with this, but it was some of the team I was talking about, uh, talking to, and, and they had, they had come up with a, a future that they felt might exist, and, and Thor was the name of the character they gave in, in that future. And so fundamentally, they were trying to project 15, uh, or 20, 10, 15 years out into the future, and, and the idea of the gig economy really resonated with them. This is where, I mean, maybe in that world, the generation of, of you know, uh, of people going through school now are out, and maybe they don't want to work full time at a company. Maybe they live in a world where all they want to do is do a little bit of work here, make a couple bucks, and you know go on living their life. And, and steady employment isn't the thing they necessarily want. So how do we how do we work in a world that looks like that? And so Thor is a scenario where we have a guy who goes into a coffee shop, he sits down and says, "Man, I could really use some money in my bank account today. Let's see what kind of arts is going to work that like me to do." Oh wow, look at this! They're going to pay that much for that shader, suckers! I can have that done before I finish my macchiato, right? So he sits down, and he's able to somehow get an entire environment from us. He's able to make his changes, check that back in, the tests get run, QA approves, and money gets deposited to his account. And that future may or may not come to pass. It doesn't make any difference to me whether it does or not. The point is, if that future comes to pass, LinkedIn is going to be a huge impediment to that with all those numbers that you saw earlier on in this conversation. We can't do that. A 250 gig source sync doesn't come for free. The hours worth of builds that need to happen, the several hours worth of testing that need to happen, those things are incredibly expensive. We're not going to be able to facilitate that type of a workflow. Someone joins the company, it often takes them days to be able to do anything useful. How can we possibly facilitate someone who's just contributing you know, a, a very short amount of effort? And so that's where we need to step back and think about not how do we do that for the sake of doing that, but a world where we can solve that problem, we can solve a lot of the other problems that we have today. And so cloud, again, this is not a new realization for us, but where we had become hung up, hung up on the cloud was, as I mentioned, we have absolutely huge numbers. If, if I need to get 50 gig artifacts back from Amazon, because I need to get them on a local Xbox to be able to do testing, that's not super practical. Now, there's lots of ways that I can sort of improve that, but the point is, we're usually doing, kind of as those numbers showed, like 20 to 100 builds a day. So am I going to be ripping you know, 50 gig builds down multiple times a day? Even if I can get that down to just deltas, it's not cheap. Um, so it's, you know, we ended up, plus it's slow. Uh, and so if my job is to deliver, uh, deliver a good experience to that developer, but to get him results as fast as possible, adding the cloud is not going to be conducive to that. So we kind of sat there for a while going, well, we don't really need to do this. Then basically overnight, you went from like, well, they're too big to cloud to like, no, no, we're too big to not cloud, you guys. What about the future where this happens? We need these workflows. We need to find a way to do this. And so we, we haven't done it yet. And we understand what the benefits of this are going to be. But the challenges are you know, new skill sets. And well, honestly, we've never really dealt with security issues that are implicated in this. That you know, we're terrified of having our games leak before we release them. You know, it's not even necessarily the source code getting out. A, a huge amount of the, the buildup around these things is, is a surprise. It needs to happen, but like there's that terror, you know, executive, security, legal, everyone's going to be terrified that if we're putting stuff off our premises, yeah. you know, we don't have as much control over that security. Now, Amazon, I'm sure, does a perfectly fine job of this, maybe better than us, so maybe that's an unnecessary worry, but we've got to culturally get everybody past that. And so our, our, our issues with the cloud haven't really been technology, well, there is uh, some, but, but most of their cultural problems. And so we, we really have to think about what that means, but everybody finally gets the benefits are there. And so there's using a huge initiative to figure out what can we do to start taking care of this, even in the even in the big space. Everything is code. I mean, this is the extreme version of um, automation as code. Rather than just having your CI CD projects there, you know, how come our infrastructure isn't there? How come you know the uh, orchestration that's going to happen when we get this into the cloud? I make sure that that's all there. Ultimately, and then this goes back to sort of that existential crisis, if we can get the whole of all of this, this value that we provide in systems that are um, available and editable and manageable by those developers that are consuming these systems, you know, how much better is their experience going to be? We get the obvious you know, consistency benefits. Um, as well, if we move things into the cloud, you know, we're not relying on physically provisioned, or not even physically provisioned, 
application, but like you know, local hardware that's still somewhat handcrafted. When we get it there, we're, we're going to make sure that we do a better job of being able to spin those things up and down based on demand, demand which allows us to actually start doing some self-healing systems. Like, it's going to be huge, but I mean, the challenges are still there. How do you get people to trust this stuff? It's going to be off-site. Um, it's not that any, you know, there's no fear that there's someone at Amazon that's tinkering on these things, but like, you know, these guys are used to having, um, you know, kits right at their desk. If they move those things further away, are they really going to trust those results? Um, problems like that. And then the complexity of building all this stuff. It's all new to us. But all of this is a really exciting challenge. And it goes back to the, the fundamental tenets of DevOps, right? That, you know, there's a chance to, you know, widen that culture, to be that glue between teams. You know, there's a cloud team at the company now. Um, largely, they're focused on being able to handle the game service. That's the obvious stuff to go into the cloud. Not necessarily internal processes, but it's able to engage those guys, educate them in what it is that, that we do, uh, and, and then be able to bridge that gap and, and be able to move this stuff and provide a better experience for the developer. Wrapping up, I have covered a lot of ground. Um, some sort of closing thoughts for this. Um, rarely right answers. I mean, I've given you a bit of a history of where this team came from. And I'm happy to admit that mistakes were made along the way. A bit of ignorance or poor leadership. And um, quite frequently, they were not recognizing that there were trade-offs. Somebody did something because obviously this is the right thing to do um, without really understanding that, that someone had already made a conscious decision to put us in that situation. And you, you've moved to a different point on the trade-off triangle, and, and maybe that's the right point for the environment that you're in today, but you may very well find that you need to push it back because it was already an optimized situation, and this was the best that was able to be accomplished. Um, Culture eats strategy for breakfast. That was a really hard lesson that we kept coming across. Obviously, with automation as code failing on us effectively twice, um, it's the sign that we keep underestimating that. People need, um, people need to understand how systems work. Teams have functions um, that they prefer to do. People don't obviously just want to change. Um, if you're going to try and change the world, make sure the world wants to be changed. Whose life are you making better is not dissimilar to that. Um, frequently, a, a lot of the, the mistakes that we made along the way were because we were optimizing our lives, not necessarily, we're, we're trying to make our lives easier. Not to, and, and there are downstream benefits to others. Every time we did that, it was a much harder sell than if we made sure that the primary benefits were to other people. And, and it's being able to recognize sometimes in, in your job, not your job in the solution space that you're working in, really what you're trying to do is enable others. And it's not who's inside of that. And that really ties into the last one. You know, it's who are your players? And going back right to the beginning of this presentation, it's recognizing that you know my team's job isn't to save time for ourselves or necessarily to save dollars for electronic arts. It's how do we save time for those developers and how do we save time for QA? Because that time that gets saved, the more time developers have to write features, the more time QA has to um, test, not test to look for bugs, to test for fun and authenticity, that's a better experience that's ultimately, ultimately getting delivered to those players. And so it's us being able to assess about, even though players are super abstracted from what we do, being able to really tie that all the way back to them. Does this thing that we're doing make their experience better? How does it make their experience better? And if it doesn't, why are we doing it? Uh, and as part of that, you know, does this give does this give you a competitive advantage, right? Like maybe it's okay if you don't make that experience better if you're doing something else. But fundamentally, um, everything needs to be tied back to um, what benefit are your players getting? Now, obviously, as a games company, players are how we think of the world. But I would challenge you guys: who are your players? There is someone that is ultimately the most downstream. Who is that group, and are they benefiting from this change that you're making? All right, and that uh, wraps up my content. Um, happy to take uh, questions. Yeah, if anyone has a question, please put it on through. We'll, we'll take care of it now. Uh, Josh, if you pull up the uh, question panel on your control panel, I did send one over to you, and then I have a, a couple if we don't get many more. Uh, just looking at one here. You mentioned open source having higher quality. It gives the impression that your source code review, whatever open source code you use, or, I'm trying to look, uh, or you or do you rely on it being safe? Uh, 
Yeah, okay. I, th I think I understand what's being asked there. So we, we're most certainly reviewing the stuff that we're um, bringing in. Absolutely. Um, there's a, <laughs> again, the, the company is still new to this and, and very much make sure that, um, that these things are heavily audited. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, for the most part, we're, I'm not going to say that we're not using the live stuff. I don't have visibility into what those, the operations teams do. Um, but for the type of stuff that we're doing, uh, it, it's largely internal tools and these types of things. So I'm not sure that safety um, uh, is necessarily the most thing on our mind. I mean, the big point about um, sort of the higher quality code uh, has more to do with when we're putting stuff back to the community. Um, if, if I have a developer who sits there and, and smashes something out in an hour, he's going to you know shunt that into one of my production pipelines, and it's probably going to live there for years. If he knows that he has a responsibility to take that thing and put it back to the open source community, that's where he might spend that extra hour or two of polish so that someone who looks at this doesn't go, wow, this guy is terrible, and, and come up with another reason to be like, electronic arts are terrible, write some better code, right? Uh, and, and so the point was actually more about um, when we do that, it puts more onus on us to actually make higher quality stuff than we might have otherwise made. Thank you. Right. Thank you for, for coming in there. I, I got one for you. Sure. When you said your games are 25 million lines of code, were you being sincere or hyperbolic? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, depends how you like to count the numbers. Absolutely, if you were to take everything that gets linked into these things and count to the line of codes, that is a, a, a legitimate number for them. Um, but yes, I'm absolutely including all of the libraries that we pull in, everything. Um, very little of that is actually outside code, so it's all, you know, those are lines of code that someone electronic arts almost always maintains. Um, but yes, but, but that said, you know, when uh, the average developer hits F5, no, he's not suddenly building 25 million lines of code. Most of the games are substantially fewer than a couple million lines. Uh, and, and that really has to do with how, quite often how old a game is. Uh, the more, you know, the, the newer games that haven't been iterating for 20 years, um, they tend to even be sub All right. Any other question? Here we go. I got, here's, a, here's another one that came through. Uh, do you really believe that you'll have developers working out of coffee shops? Uh, I don't know. I, mean, I really like the narrative associated with that because it's, if I go to an executive, I'm like, we need to do, you know, everything as a service. Eh, you know, I, I kind of get eye rolls and it's like, do we really need to do that? Like. You guys, your existential crisis can be your little thing. Don't, don't bother us with those things. If you tell the story, it's like, listen, there's a future where, like, guys are going to work in coffee shops, and guys, people are going to work out of coffee shops, and, like, we need to be able to engage if they want to. That, that sends something, you know, that, that's a message that starts to resonate with people. And so I, I really like the narrative. I don't know. I mean, I've got, you know, two young children right now, and, you know, I really wonder if, if the world they grew up in is going to be one where everybody goes and gets their you know, nine to five and, um, you know, drives into the office and, and chips away before going home. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe there really is a world where these guys, I, and I'm assuming that they're going to live with me forever in order to make this happen, um, but, but that's it. Maybe they, they, they live with me and I'm not giving them money, so they just go do the occasional odd jobs. And if they have the skills to, you know, write shaders for us, we should probably be able to take advantage of that. And the, the, the big thing that, I, I, you know, the big reason I really want to uh, push this narrative now and be able to enable this functionality is I do think if someone isn't already doing this, I think there will be a market for this. I believe that you already see things like this with, you know, logo design, graphics, uh, all over the place in the art world where someone's able to sort of spec out what they're after and, and multiple people will come forward to try and bid for that money. Now, engineering, I think that's probably going to be uh, more difficult, um, not because engineering is necessarily more difficult, more for me to spec out what I want means I have to have a, it's almost easier to just, I was about to claim that it might be easier to describe what I want than a logo, which maybe is easy for some, not for me, but I feel like even, even describing a logo is probably easier than with words, writing what it is that I want um, a function to actually do. And, and so I think there are a bunch of challenges there, but I think there are lots of um, companies and engineers that are mature enough to be able to do that quite adeptly. Um, and if they've got the discipline to be able to spec out what they need and not have to put the effort into writing it themselves, I think it's very conceivable that there's a world where you could 
outsource to the highest bidder um, your engineering at an extremely low level, like a function type level. So yeah, I, I think that world could come to pass, but whether it'll be in our lifetimes, who knows. Maybe the robots will all be doing it by then. I hear AI is going to be big. That was great. I'm going to, I'm passing one over to you, Josh, to read on your end. Before you start answering, I just want to kind of let everyone know. Um, we are approaching the end, so if you do have questions, you know, make sure that you keep them coming so that we can get to them all. Uh, I also want to let everyone know that I, I failed to mention this at the beginning of the session, and Josh, you don't mind my quick plug, but Jenkins World Registration actually went live today. So I just posted a link and a code in the uh, chat window for everyone for $399 registration, which is cheaper than even our super early bird price. I just want to make sure everyone saw it if you're looking to take advantage of that. But uh, back to you, Josh. Sounds good. Uh, so this question comes in, what would it take for the trend of moving computing to the cloud to change and return to on-premises computing, like downloading your 50 gig artifacts? That's an interesting one. So, I mean, as I said, we really avoided it for a long time because we kept pointing at our artifact size and going, this is simply impractical. Um, I think you'd have to step and, and figure out which question you were trying to solve. So it, it goes back a little bit to the last question, which is, if I think the gig economy for game development is going to be a thing, then I either need to put, uh, I need to either solve my artifact problem or like my getting 250 gig source trees, and by that time it might be terabyte source trees, I have to solve getting that to people, um, which architecturally might be something that we could do, just give them the smallest possible component they can actually iterate on, um, or I have to be able to put infrastructure close to everybody, uh, and we're certainly not going to be the business of doing that. So we're heading that way now, but if, if we weren't to want to solve that problem, if we were to go, no, 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 even if that happens, we always want to put you know, seats and chairs at our physical studios. Um, I, I really, it's an interesting one. I think you know, performance-wise, there's probably a lot more room for optimization control. Uh, if you want to go really deep into, um, into the mud of how your systems work, how your um, like how your workflows work and how your hardware optimizes for those particular workflows. I guess maybe it goes a little bit to like the CI engine, which is once things kind of stop changing and you don't need the elasticity or the other benefits you get from those systems, once it's incredibly static, that's where there becomes a lot of really good opportunity to optimize. And, and so for us, I think the, the big push to the cloud has been substantially due to elasticity. And I think for game servers, that's almost always going to be necessary. Uh, we really have no idea, how, well, not really no idea, but like it's kind of witchcraft to figure out whether a game is going to be big or it's not going to be big. And so the times where we went and bought a billion servers before we launched something we thought was going to be huge and it wasn't were really expensive. Obviously, there are numerous stories of um, when we did the opposite and we, we bought too few and nobody could log on for those weekends. So I mean, elasticity is huge to be able to insulate us from those particular problems. But in the case of, say, the build space, um, you know, if the company were to come and say, actually, we did a really nice equilibrium, we're going to iterate on all these games, we're holding headcount flat, and all the teams were to come and say, you know what, we have just the right amount of CI, we don't need any more, um, probably we wouldn't be getting any of the benefits of that elasticity, at which point having it, you know, on-prem and, and heavily optimized for exactly those workflows is probably going to be the most performant. And I think that maybe the succinct answer I should have been to that question is where you know how, how you can get performance that's probably where it is. When you can buy it for performance rather than elasticity. That was a, a really great answer, I think. Uh, and we're at two minutes left, so I just want to put out one more to you before we uh, before we sign off, which is: Do you actually have a McDonald's-style hour count? Oh, I read that wrong. Sorry. Do you actually have a McDonald's-style hour counter? Not yet, but uh, certainly something I'd want to build. The the, the metaphor around that is um, something that came up quite recently. I actually only found out that someone was telling me, hey, like, we did 2 million hours of testing on this stuff, and geez, that's a lot, and it was them who had caught me into it. So uh, there's been conversation for a couple of weeks around, like, how would we meaningfully build that? And I think we've got some ideas, so maybe, maybe check back in a couple of months. I hope to have one is the, the, the definite answer. All right, great. Well, thank you, Josh, and thank you to everyone who stayed on and watched, and thank you for your questions. Uh, as I said earlier, hopefully you've been on some of the other webinars in this series, and hopefully you're on some of the other ones today. Uh, that's all I have for today. Josh, you have any parting words, or are you all good? 
Uh, no, I'm pretty good. Thanks everybody for attending. Uh, really appreciate it. Sounds and don't great. hesitate to get in touch. I'm not sure I give an email, but if Max does, please do. Please keep asking questions. I'm, uh, if it isn't already obvious, I love to talk, so please do get in touch. Absolutely. If you go right to the uh, reminder emails you get and reply to them, it'll, it should come right to me. So if you're looking to get in touch with them, just let me know and I'll pass you right along. So thanks again, thanks. everyone, and we'll see you on the next one.